Well, this will be very fun. Howdy, my dear Good Omens fans. Since none of us can cope, and we keep punishing ourselves and each other with an overwhelming amount of edits, fan art, and fan fiction, we need to talk about the show. If you clicked on this video, I will assume that you have witnessed everything that the show has to offer up to date, even the sixth episode of season two that left all of us in shambles. But we'll talk about that later. However, if you're still in the dark about it, I would suggest to click off this video and come back when you'll be up to speed to hear my take on it. Because of course, there will be major spoilers ahead. I'll wait. All right, let's jump right in. Ah, Good Omens, a marvelous multi-format creation that started off with a novel and developed into the show that we all know and love. With one of the most dedicated and creative fans I have seen in a while. You guys are really something. The casting process began with the development of the script and the involvement of Neil Gaiman as the show's creator and showrunner. Gaiman was instrumental in shaping the vision for the series and played a pivotal role in casting decisions. The characters of Aziraphale, an angel, and Crowley, a demon, are at the heart of the story. Their unique dynamic and chemistry between them were critical to the success of the series. Gaiman and the casting team were looking for actors who could not only embody these roles individually, but also create a compelling on-screen partnership. Michael Sheen was cast as Aziraphale, the not-so-holy angel who loves rare books, gourmet dining, and other earthly pleasures. His nuanced and versatile acting style made him an ideal choice for the role. Sheen brought a depth of character to Aziraphale, capturing the angel's inherent goodness, while also showcasing his quirks and vulnerabilities, as well as implementing not-so-subtle details into his character's behavior and sharing quite a few one-sided staring contests with his best friend. Yeah, Michael, we all know what you're doing. And thank you for that. Originally, Shane was considered for the role of the demon Crowley. However, he mentioned in his interviews that he resonated more with the angel, and they decided to give him the role of Aziraphale. But I think we all wonder what the show would have looked like if they made a different choice. Well, perhaps something like this? Or this or maybe even this <clears throat> where was i ah right for the not so evil demon crowley with a liking for fast driving and non-conventional ways of gardening was chosen david tennant tennant's charismatic and dynamic performance added layers to crowley's character capturing his wickedness whilst also revealing his underlying complexity and humanity. David implemented quite a few, I would say, creative ideas into his behavior, which were not left unnoticed. Say, I arrest you, anything you say, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> not, not a... Oh, no, no, it's not a... It's not like that. You cry. What? No, 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 I mean, especially if they're looking for and I know for some members of the police force, it's a bit of a hobby. Oh, yeah, 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 no, 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 no. Celestial harmonies. I've told you, I'm not helping you. I'm not interested. This is purely social. <laughs> David, what was that? Honestly, these two are a match made in heaven. <laughs> and turned out to be the perfect fit for their roles, which made a huge impact on how successful the show became. Beyond the Leads, casting directors were tasked with selecting a strong ensemble cast to bring many characters from the novel to life. This included Anamitha Device, Newton Pulsifier, Shadwell, Agnes Nutter, and many more. The casting team aimed to find actors who could capture the quirky and eccentric essence of these characters and have done an outstanding job, may I add. Alrighty. Brace yourselves as I summarize season one. The story revolves around an angel and a demon who have been on Earth since its creation, carrying out celestial duties, but also indulging in some earthly pleasures like fine wine, art, and some interesting fashion choices. 
These two unlikely besties have gotten rather attached to humanity and built an unexpected connection with each other, which their respective sides would surely not understand. The main story begins when they find out some quite worrisome news. They've grown quite fond of the planet and are not particularly thrilled when they discover that the apocalypse is on the way. An 11-year-old antichrist named Adam has been misplaced thanks to a satanic mix-up at the hospital. He is living a perfectly normal life in Lower Tadfield with his group of friends while the four horsemen of the apocalypse are gearing up for the end of the world. The show playfully explores the struggles of Aziraphale and Crowley to prevent the apocalypse and humor the audience with some other intriguing characters. There's a witch, a witch hunter, a quirky psychic, and a bunch of bickering angels and demons, all trying to play their part in this captivating story. As for the differences from the novel, you'll find some delightful additions that weren't in the book. Like a 30-minute cold open that shows Aziraphale's and Crowley's friendship developing through history. Season 1 itself is an outstanding take on the novel that very skillfully juggles many storylines. It has its flaws, but overall, it's a witty, amusing, and sometimes campy and rather interesting season. And now, here we are. Season 2. Okay, you guys, I know what we're all thinking, and oh, don't you worry, we'll get there. But first things first. Season 2 came out on July 28th, 2023. It's a continuation of the story after the apocalypse was averted, which means that the story we all know so well was solely created for the show and is no longer based on the novel. It's a bridge season of sorts to set up the scene for season three, which we are still really hoping will be greenlit. In the prior season, Aziraphale and Crowley managed to prevent heaven and hell from erasing them from existence. They posed as each other to avoid their punishment for stopping the Armageddon. And may I add that Michael's and David's take on each other's portrayal of their characters was insanely good. And they were not simply playing reverse characters, no, 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 no. But their characters posing as one another. Aziraphale played Crowley really cool because that's the way he sees him. And Crowley portrayed Aziraphale as always kind, even when the other angels were so disrespectful towards him. And that little detail of Crowley nailing the mimics and body language, however, his biggest giveaway, were his eyes. Crowley obviously walks around in sunglasses most of the time, and controlling his eyes is not something that he has to think about. So adding that detail to the scene was such a nice bonus. Truly, good job, Michael. At the beginning of the season, we get slapped in the face with the cuteness of the angel version of Crowley. And see how he created a nebula with a Xerophel by his side. This tells us that their first meeting was apparently much earlier than we had initially thought. And this, just this. Look at you, you're gorgeous. Don't worry, Aziraphale, you're gorgeous too. Aziraphale strikes Crowley with the news that his beloved project will be eliminated in 6,000 years, which in turn makes Crowley question the plan of the Almighty, and then leads to his fall. Would you look, word to the wise. I'd hate to see you getting into any trouble. Mm, thanks for your help. And thanks for your advice. I wouldn't worry though. How much trouble can I get into just for asking a few questions? Oh, sweetie. The main story of the season begins when a former Supreme Archangel Gabriel, amnestic and naked, comes to Aziraphale's bookshop and sets in place the main conflict of the season. And because of this turn of events, our favorite duo has to decide what to do with him. How's your naked man, friend? He's not. He's not mine. But he's certainly not naked anymore. You're a dark horse, Mr. Fell. Oh, Nina, the wonderful person that she is. She sees an opportunity and she takes it. I mean, who wouldn't want to know what this bookseller is up to when you see him in the epicenter of events that make you ask questions? 
with a naked man friend making quite an entrance, and this thin, dark duke always coming in and out of the bookshop and following Aziraphale around. Yeah, we get why she asked. And it did seem like she was doing a little experiment for some confirmation about the suspicions that she had. And oh boy, I think she got what she asked for. At first, Crowley doesn't want to help Aziraphale with his plan to hide Jim. But as soon as he finds out that both Hell and Heaven are desperately looking for the former Supreme Archangel, he can't help but rush back to save his angel. Because of the plan that they come up with, we find out that even when the two of them try to perform the tiniest miracle together, it turns out to be extremely powerful. This is a very curious detail, which would be very interesting to explore in Season 3. Overall, this season turned out to be quite charming, very queer, and wholesome. Until the Metatron showed up, of course, and decided to fuck it all up. Now, let's dive a little deeper into our two favorite characters that can't properly communicate, even at gunpoint. Crowley is the type of character that is very difficult not to fall in love with. With his quirks and undeniably entertaining sarcasm, he's extremely easy to sympathize with, as his backstory is so beautifully written. When we find out why he really fell, we can't help but notice the injustice in this event and feel drawn to the character even more. While he is a demon and technically serves hell, Crowley often goes out of his way to avoid doing anything too evil, and he sometimes actively works against hell's interests especially when it comes to saving the world from destruction. He also doesn't trust heaven and sees them as a bureaucratic and authoritarian institution, which he finds unappealing. He is not a fan of either heaven or hell and mentions he's on his side because throughout time, he understood that neither felt like home, but earth and humanity did. Although he is a demon, Crowley feels more human than a lot of characters we see on screen these days. Crowley's character is defined by his tendency to ask questions, his attachment to the human world, and his reluctance to conform to the traditional expectations of a demon. He mentions numerous times that he never intended to fall, which makes his story even more heartbreaking because of the unfairness of the situation. This makes the viewers ask questions about what the reason for an angel's fall must be. Is it God's decision? Do other angels make that choice? Or was Crowley himself responsible for his fall? Which is the most supported theory, based on what we see in the novel and the show. However, there is still not enough information to make conclusions. When we take into consideration that Aziraphale had sinned numerous times throughout history, however, never became a demon himself. Is it because Aziraphale viewed himself as inherently good and still had a trust in the goodness of heaven and God's greater plan? Would that mean that by having doubts, Crowley subconsciously started viewing himself as no longer holy enough for doubting God's choices? There are many questions that are still left unanswered about his character, which might be addressed in season three. Overall, Crowley's character has its layers, and that's what a good character writing should be. There is nothing worse than one-note characters that don't have any complexity and don't go through any character development throughout the story. Crowley is not necessarily good or evil, but he feels like a real person who the viewers can relate to. And David's performance only enhances his charm and makes him even more compelling and likable. Anything from his little and not always so subtle quirky facial expressions, sometimes really theatrical tone of voice, and of course, the unforgettable signature walk that only David Tennant can do in these skinny jeans. Fans theorize that Crowley fell in love with Aziraphale all the way back in Eden when he saw how Aziraphale gave away his flaming sword because he wanted to keep the humans safe. However, we all know that Crowley really starts to admit this to himself and question their relationship after that conversation that he had with Nina. For the most part, Crowley doesn't regret becoming a demon because he really doesn't agree with the way things are run in heaven. But there is a part of him that believes that him and Aziraphale could never be together because of the way he is. Because his angel 
could never choose him over heaven. Aziraphale is a loyal angel that believes in the greater plan of the Almighty. Or at least he's trying to convince himself that he does. Unlike Crowley, who began to question the intentions of God herself, which afterwards led to his fall, Aziraphale is truly trying to believe that they don't really need to understand everything that the Almighty decides to do because it is all done for the greater good. However, throughout the show, we can see Aziraphale being unsure about certain decisions that God makes. Aziraphale expresses concern about the flood when God decides to wipe out humanity, but then chooses not to question it any further, comforting himself with the thought that it must be this way if God herself says so. As well as when God allows Satan to taste Job's faith by bringing tremendous suffering upon him. Aziraphale is troubled by Job's suffering and the way God allows it to happen. Although Aziraphale doesn't agree with these decisions, he never fully allows himself to openly challenge God's plans. He believes that God and heaven are inherently good and all that must be happening for a good reason. The angel is often blindsided by his true belief that heaven must be good because they're the good guys. It is the way it's supposed to be. Aziraphale is torn between all he was taught, which is that heaven is good and God's plan is ineffable, and what his gut is telling him, which is that he doesn't agree with everything that the Almighty and heaven do. The angel also tries to convince himself that his friendship with Crowley is wrong because they are on opposite sides, but he can't force himself to stay away from the demon. Crowley is his only true friend, and no matter the fact that he keeps reminding him that he is a demon and one of the bad guys, he knows that Crowley is truly kind and he understands him like no one else does. The tragedy is that he never allows himself to have feelings for Crowley because he is the enemy, until Crowley saves his books in 1941. This is when he, allegedly, accepts how he truly feels about the demon. And I mean, guys, this scene. You know, um, that was a very nice thing you did for me. Shut up. Well, there must be something I can do for you. Crowley, read the room, my guy. <sighs> I can't with these two. Since in season two, both of them no longer have to report back to heaven or hell and are sort of let off the hook, it becomes clear that the angel finally feels more comfortable with being affectionate with Crowley. I mean, he was never really good at hiding what he actually thinks about the demon, but this season, he was so touchy-feely that it was very difficult to miss. Actually, I rather thought I might take the car. What car? Our car. Don't hesitate to ask me if you have any other questions about love, Inspector Constable. I'll just be here helping to run this. I'm a little bemused as to why Crowley should risk destruction for you. You don't seem his type at all. He could smite me. When Gabriel smites you, you've been... Smited? Smoked? Smitten, I believe. You're being silly. Something really wrong. Or well, perhaps you could tell me while we dance. We don't dance. I still don't know, though, if it was the way it was written, or perhaps Michael knew exactly what the audience wanted after indulging in some fan fiction that he talked about, and he decided to implement that himself. I guess we might never know. Unless, of course, Michael Sheen will tell us. Oh yeah, and by the way, it is quite hilarious knowing that someone named their two sons after Crowley and Aziraphale, saying that it didn't seem that they had a romantic connection. Goddamn, must be a little awkward now, huh? Man, I really don't understand how they came to that conclusion. Unless, of course, they were reading the novel or watching the show with both a blindfold and headphones on. I mean, really? You thought they were buddies after these scenes? Going home, Angel. I'm getting my stuff and I'm leaving. And when I'm off in the stars, I won't even think about you. Come up with something, or, or I'll never talk to you again. Can we get on? It ain't Angel. 
about the puddle of burning goo, we can go off together. Go off together? I rest my case. No matter how much more decisive Aziraphale is in season two, he still doesn't dare to talk about his feelings yet. Fans have speculated that at the night of the ball, it really seemed like Aziraphale wanted to confess. And to that I say, yes, I can see that happening. I mean, look at him. Making it rain is one thing, but a bull with... Look, there's something wrong. There is something really wrong. Well, perhaps you could tell me while we dance. We don't dance. <laughs> sent demons. They are milling around outside. They want Gabriel. But perfectly safe in here. Technically, this bookshop still counts as an embassy. I think you need to stop this charade, and we need to work out what to do. I am not giving them Jim. People will get hurt, Angel. I think you're overestimating how much trouble we're actually in. However, Aziraphale's naivety is precisely what leads to him making the decision that he did in episode 6. He is hopeful that he can change things and make it better for everyone, most importantly for himself and his demon. Although, this is not why he agreed to go to heaven, and we will talk about this in detail later. We all knew this was coming. This was inevitable, because you can't talk about the show without dissecting episode six. All right, my friends, I know this will be tough, I know it, but we can do it. If we can get through all those edits on TikTok, we can do this analysis together as well. Oh God, this asshole, do we need to talk about him? Oh, all right. I want to begin by emphasizing that when I talk about the character, in no way am I referring to Derek Jacobi. He was great in the role, and we always need to separate the actor and their character. That being said, I hate this dude. The season is chaotic because Aziraphale and Crowley are trying to help Gabriel and avoid punishment for doing so, and they almost succeed. But then, the Metatron drags his lying ass into the bookshop with a very precise plan to separate the ineffable husbands by giving Aziraphale false promises and driving a wedge between them. The audacity. I know, I know, otherwise it wouldn't be interesting to watch the show if there wouldn't be any drama. But dude, we have to most likely wait at least two to three years at best to get a third season. So the trauma after the last episode will stay with us for a while. There are so many little details in the scenes with the Metatron, which only leave us with more questions. Why did he bring Aziraphale the coffee? Was that a manipulation tactic? Why did he ask Nina if anyone ever asks for death? Is it a hint that if Aziraphale would say no to his offer, that would have been his and or Crowley's fate? Why is there allegedly a slight sound of a miracle being performed when he hands Aziraphale the coffee? Did he do something to it? Was that a miracle to convince the angel to agree to go to heaven? Or was it Aziraphale or Crowley to make sure that there wasn't anything in the coffee that would harm the angel? What did they talk about off screen? Did he threaten Aziraphale, and was that the reason he decided to become the Supreme Archangel? Did he tell him that he knows about their relationship and there will be consequences if he rejects the offer? Did he deliberately offer to make Crowley an angel again because he knew he would never agree to it? And also, why does he act so normal around humans? I mean, other angels are like aliens in the human world, knowing almost nothing about people, but the Metatron he has an ordinary conversation with Nina and knows how to order coffee. Also, during conversation, he uses British slang, which other representatives of heaven, apart from Aziraphale, of course, never do. And as we all know, Aziraphale has been on Earth since the beginning, so for him, it is completely normal. Even his clothes are odd. The darkest color we see an angel wear in the show is gray. 
but in no way we ever saw someone from heaven wearing a black tie and a black suit. He does say that this draws less attention, but how does he know? He seems to have a lot of knowledge about humans, which doesn't seem to be so common amongst angels. This dude brings more questions than answers, really. What is clear is that the Metatron does not have good intentions when he visits Aziraphale. The question that he asks Nina is a clear analogy to his offer that he made to Aziraphale. He might not have outright threatened him, but most likely used his manipulation tactics to push Aziraphale to agree. Since the very beginning, when he showed up in the bookshop and offered Aziraphale the coffee, he made sure to make Aziraphale feel okay in indulging. Another great detail that translates to his conversation with Aziraphale is what he says to Nina. So predictable when he's talking about humans and the choices they make. This is a direct correlation to the way he perceives both Aziraphale and Crowley. He clearly knows about them together and who they are as individuals. This makes the offer that he made to Aziraphale even more malicious. He knew that it was unlikely that the angel would agree to his offer and leave Crowley on Earth. However, if he made him believe that Crowley would be reinstated and join him in heaven, Aziraphale was much more likely to agree. And of course, the Metatron evidently knows Crowley and knew very well that he would never agree to go back to heaven. This dynamic duo unfortunately has quite a big communication problem, and that's why the Metatron could separate the two with his lies. His biggest manipulative tactic that worked wonderfully was him mentioning the second coming to Aziraphale as soon as he saw the angel have doubts. And naturally, his plan worked. Because as he said, they are so predictable. I don't think that anyone will be surprised when I say that the biggest issue these two have is that they are terrible at communicating, especially at talking about their feelings. We'll never know if the finale would go down the same way if they had properly talked about how they feel. Allegedly, the reason the Metatron's plan could have worked and he was able to keep them apart could be if Aziraphale didn't know how much pain Crowley really experienced because of his fall how much trauma he had to deal with and how he had to rebuild himself and find ways to cope, which clearly haven't worked. Because even in the present, we can see how heartbroken Crowley is sometimes and how he mentions that he never intended to fall. This event, however, left an enormous impact on his life. And even when he became a demon and had to serve hell, he never stopped questioning authority and being true to himself when he saw that the system is flawed. That's why he mentions that he goes along with hell as much as he can, but he, after all, is on his side. Aziraphale, on the contrary, prides himself on being an angel, and it is an inseparable part of him. Sometimes he has black and white thinking, which is influenced by everything he was taught throughout his existence, and that heaven is good and hell is bad but deep down he knows that it isn't necessarily true. He saw angels make cruel decisions that he doesn't agree with, and also saw how demons can be kind by being friends with Crowley. Throughout the past 6,000 years, he is constantly conflicted between doing what he's told and doing what his heart is telling him. So by making this offer, the Metatron hit the jackpot. Because offering a zero fell to help change heaven is like offering a kid candy. That would help him resolve his inner conflict by making heaven better. However, the Metatron is clever and he knew that even though Aziraphale wants to make a change in heaven, he would never leave Crowley behind. So he came up with a plan to screw with both of their minds, counting on their lack of communication. Aziraphale might actually not know how much suffering Crowley had to endure when he fell, because the demon never shared that with him. It is quite a common pattern that they fall into, with the best example being that he didn't tell his angel that he has been living in his car for ages. He doesn't want to show his weakness and burden Aziraphale, so he never truly opens his heart to him. 
And that's why Aziraphale could have been surprised by Crowley's refusal to accept his offer to go back to heaven. In his eyes, heaven is a much better option than hell. And he doesn't understand how Crowley could say no, especially because he thinks that they could finally be together when they're there. Here we are. The kiss. Let's dissect the scene. The scene starts with Aziraphale interrupting Crowley when he was about to confess. And he says, hold that thought. Although some fans think that if the angel would have allowed the demon to speak first, it would have changed things. I personally don't see it. I think that no matter what Crowley would have said, he wouldn't have changed Aziraphale's mind. And that is very much visible when the demon does confess because Aziraphale still chooses heaven over him. Aziraphale continues his speech. He talks about the Metatron and his character, mentioning that he might have misjudged him. However, we don't see most of the conversation they had, but we do see him buttering up Aziraphale with some nice words. The Metatron has put on a show of kindness and made Aziraphale feel important whilst pitching his proposal. And of course, the last nail in the coffin to make him agree is reassuring Aziraphale that he can take Crowley with him. It makes you think, why did the Metatron choose Aziraphale? The most logical conclusion here is obviously to separate the two, because he was aware of how powerful they could be together and didn't want them to stop his plans about the second coming. Because of his naivety, Aziraphale thought that Crowley would be happy to go back to heaven and become an angel again. He says that it could be like the old times, only nicer, because he thinks that now they could finally be together in heaven. Crowley, on the other hand, is hoping that Aziraphale knows him better than that and is thinking that the angel would decline the offer. Crowley's response surprises the angel as he can't fathom how his friend wouldn't want to be reinstated. But Crowley knows how things are run in heaven and hell and has made his peace with that. He's no longer choosing a side. He simply chooses Aziraphale. And then the tragedy strikes when Aziraphale says that it is obvious that Crowley would say no to hell because you are the bad guys. Aziraphale is so deeply controlled by his religious trauma that even though he has known his best friend forever, he still refers to him as one of the bad guys, disregarding his true feelings and that he knows for a fact that Crowley has a good heart. But he can't help himself. He's greatly conflicted because he is truly hoping that he can make a change. No matter how many times Aziraphale witnessed heaven make choices that he didn't agree with, he still believes that this is the place of light and good. He refuses to see that the fight between heaven and hell is no longer a fight between good and evil. It is simply a fight for power. Crowley is in disbelief that his best friend is so blind to the truth because he himself had to go through a transformation and started seeing things through his perspective and is no longer affected by the opinions of heaven or hell. It is in his nature to question things and to find his own truth, which is the opposite of how Aziraphale operates. Because the angel is so terribly afraid to open his eyes, since if he's not on the path of light, serving heaven as an angel, what does he have? This is a pivotal point when Crowley dares to tell his angel the truth about his feelings. Because he can feel Aziraphale slipping away through his fingers, and he is terrified to lose him. Crowley is hoping that he can show Aziraphale that they can be together, and they don't need heaven or hell, just like Gabriel and Beelzebub. Because he always feared that Aziraphale would never choose him because Crowley is a demon. So this scene is him living out his worst nightmare. When Aziraphale makes another attempt to make Crowley see reason and says that he needs him, what he really feels is that he can't bear the thought of them not being together, which is then confirmed by the amount of doubt we see on his face when he's leaving with the Metatron. Aziraphale doesn't want to leave without Crowley, but he also can let go of heaven to be with him. In turn, when Crowley doesn't know what else to do to make his angel stay, 
he resorts to the last possible action he can take to show how much Aziraphale means to him. However, this kiss is a hell of a mixture of conflicting emotions, filled with desperation, pain, longing, disgust, hope, and want. This is Crowley's attempt to make him stay by introducing Aziraphale to a new sensation that he would be leaving behind, just like he has been doing throughout the years. And in his desperation, he really hopes that just maybe, after this kiss and giving his heart to the angel, Aziraphale will choose him. But instead, his angel forgives him, confirming Crowley's worst suspicions that he will never be enough for Aziraphale. The path of forgiveness is a very prominent motif for Aziraphale, and we see it play out a lot throughout the story. For me, it is difficult to tell why those were the words that Aziraphale chose to say. Did he mean that he forgives Crowley for trying to tempt him into staying? Or did he mean that he forgives him for refusing to go with him to heaven? This is a very curious part that becomes even more fascinating when we take into consideration the recent developments. That being Rob Wilkins, the executive producer of the show, stating that the look on Aziraphale's face after the kiss was saying, do that again, please, right now. But also the shock of the fact that it happened, which is an interesting development. And before he says, I forgive you, it does seem like Aziraphale is mouthing some words that look either like, I can't, or again. With that being said, the last drop of my sanity evaporated when Crowley left and Aziraphale pressed his fingers to his lips, which in this context makes the thing that Wilkins said even more tragic because it feels similar to that scene where he devoured that ox rib and found out that he was starving this entire time. And now let's pause and imagine what this kiss must have done to him. This scene is the biggest confirmation that it's like these two are speaking different languages and can't understand each other. Crowley thinks that Aziraphale is trying to change him and is projecting his insecurity of thinking that he will never be enough for Aziraphale. However, he knows better than to choose sides again. And for Aziraphale, being an angel and doing good is an inseparable part of his identity. So he can't understand how Crowley wouldn't want to make a change in the world because that is Aziraphale's nature and he doesn't know anything else. So, the biggest takeaway from the last scene is that unless these two will learn how to talk about their feelings with each other with complete and total honesty, they will keep repeating the same pattern. After the release of season two, many fans started creating theories about why the events of episode six unfolded the way they did. And I would definitely recommend for you to check them out, but I won't be mentioning them in this video. You can find plenty of theories both on TikTok and YouTube. Now, although I believe they are fascinating and quite clever theories, I think the explanation is much easier than that. I know that some fans speculate that the decision to leave Crowley was out of character for Aziraphale, and I actually disagree. In my humble opinion, this sounds exactly like something the angel would do. Aziraphale is hopeful that he can fix things and make it better for everyone. Compared to Crowley, he is still naive and hasn't been burned by heaven the way the demon has. And when the Metatron paints this pretty picture to him and says that he can bring the love of his life with him, which is a clear manipulation tactic, Aziraphale falls for it. He still remembers the angel that Crowley used to be and doesn't understand how his friend could refuse to be reinstated. Because to Aziraphale, being an angel is extremely important. It is a part of who he is. He can't imagine what life would be if he wouldn't be one. So he projects his thinking on Crowley. He is taught that heaven is the epitome of good. So he prides himself as a representative of the good side. However, throughout the years, he noticed that heaven 
is not as holy as it wants to appear. And this realization would shatter Aziraphale's entire perception of reality and his views on himself. So instead, he turns a blind eye and doesn't want to admit that to himself. His entire self-perception is based on him wanting to be good and to do good. So if heaven is no longer the definition of good, then what is his purpose? This existential crisis would haunt Aziraphale if he would admit that to himself. And subconsciously, he knows that. So when he sees an opportunity to make heaven better, he clings to it. And then he understands that he can turn back and stay with Curly because the Metatron mentions the second coming. And that's unfortunately when the trap slams shut. Aziraphale almost changes his mind and goes back to Crowley. But as soon as he hears the Metatron mention the second coming, there is no turning back. There is no chance for Aziraphale to refuse the offer. Not when there is so much at stake. He deeply loves Crowley, but he's also an angel and is selfless and kind and he can not choose his own happiness over the lives of so many humans. This is made clear when Aziraphale takes in Jim and decides to help him. No matter how cruel Gabriel used to be with him and that by hiding the angel, he's putting himself in danger, Aziraphale doesn't even entertain the idea of abandoning him. He is truly the epitome of kindness. And that's why the Metatron's plan is so effective. Now, what do we know about season three? Well, as of now, the show has not been renewed for season three yet. However, Neil Gaiman spoke about his desire to work on a third season to conclude the story and also mentioned that the season has been plotted and it will be based on the story that they worked on with Terry Pratchett as a continuation to their novel. If the show will be renewed for a third season, then the release date might be in 2026 at the earliest. It also has been mentioned that it will be darker. And with the recent news of the director Douglas McKinnon leaving the show, we can expect the show to have a very different tone to it as well. However, if the show won't be renewed for season three, Gaiman also said that he would not leave the story unfinished and in that case would write another book to conclude it. And this is what I personally would love to see in season three. It would be very interesting to witness the whole capacity of Aziraphale's and Curly's powers when they're working together. Because if the tiniest miracle could have created such a ruckus, what would a big miracle look like? As well as to see more character development and growth from Crowley and especially Aziraphale. I personally would love to hear more about the reason Crowley fell and explore that topic further, as well as seeing how Crowley is coping with Aziraphale's departure to heaven. When it comes to Aziraphale, I believe that there is so much potential for character development here because if my suspicions are correct and he made the conscious decision to go to heaven himself, he will have to own up to his mistakes when all of that will go to shit and he will realize that he should have never left Crowley. It would be such a powerful story to explore and to see Aziraphale finally opening his eyes to what he knew all along but never wanted to admit and for him to finally let go of heaven and to choose to be an us. I truly admire the dedication of everyone who's a part of the show, starting with an iconic and hilarious responses that Neil provides that fuel the fandom for days to come, and the brilliant story that him and Terry Pratchett shared with the world. I love the wonderful content that David and Michael provide together and separately, from how passionately they talk about each other and the show, it is truly beautiful and makes everyone obsess over the show even more. It is so difficult to believe that for this outstanding chemistry to develop, all they needed was 45 minutes of the first table read. Georgia Tennant, in general. <laughs> the wonderful wife that she is, knowing the fans too well and sharing their lives with the fandom, and very publicly supporting her husband. Everyone truly needs a Georgia in their life. 
And of course, the support that David shows for the LGBTQ plus community really speaks volumes about his character. And I couldn't not mention Michael's presence online. I honestly <laughs> have never seen anything like this before. This man keeps everyone on their tippy toes on the regular, be it interviews, tweets, or <laughs> anything he posts really. He knows exactly what to say to make the fandom freak out. And I believe that everyone will agree that he definitely read those fanfics. Moreover, it is incredible to see the supportive messages that he posts to cheer up his fans that are going through tough times. Overall, the entire team is incredible and makes the fans feel seen and appreciated. I believe it is clear that the whole fandom is waiting for the day when the show will be renewed for season 3, so we could find out how Gaiman and Pratchett were planning to end the story. So, you want to know my final thoughts about Good Omens? Alright. I think what truly makes both the novel and the show so great is the writing. I'm a true believer that all parts of production are crucial for the project to work out. However, even the best acting, set design, and most creative camera shots cannot save a bad script. This show is a great example of how good writing can be enhanced by an outstanding performance of everybody else that is involved in bringing the show to life. It is a captivating story with layered characters that are flawed and feel like real people. This makes it so much easier for viewers to connect with them because Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett spend time crafting these complex characters and gripping story. Now, I will say my last words of wisdom as our journey together is coming to an end. I think that Good Omens is fucking great. And oh my god, we better get a season three.